Well, I feel like the Lord already this morning said, uh, I want you to be my ambassador. Uh, and so I'm here today to be his ambassador because I believe he's getting ready to come back soon, don't you? I believe he's getting ready to come back soon. But again, giving honor to your pastors, such, such beautiful, beautiful people. We love them. What's the greatest invitation that you've ever received in your life? Maybe you received an invitation from the mayor or maybe from a president or from someone else. I, uh, I was thinking about, uh, and we all have different things that come to our mind. Several years ago, one of my uh, spiritual godmothers, Naomi Gandia, called. She lives in New York. She said, uh, Mariano Rivera from the New York Yankees wants to have dinner with you, a private dinner. And of course, I love Mariano, the, the cleanup, right? I mean, he could do it. And so we went to dinner with him, and then he carried us over to uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle Church with uh, Pastor Jim Sambala. I was able to go into his office and sit there in that place where he sp spends so many times of prayer. And then at the end of the service that night, I went out to, went to get the taxi, and it was cold. It was December or January. And uh, Mariano said, I'll go stand with you outside. So I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, you know, country boy done good, man. I'm here, I, you know, just from the cornfields of Illinois to standing here with Mani, Mariano Rivera. How, what great invitation. I think we all have different invitations that are given. They come in lots of ways, right? You get, the, you remember the formal invitation somebody sends you? Then there's a casual invitation. And then we're in a new era today with social media. You get the invites online. And so it's good because then you can go online and see who's coming because they will have responded. And if it's those people that, you know, that you just don't like to hang out with, you can push, uh, sorry, can't come, interested, but not today. But I don't know of anybody who sends out a greater invitation than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Master Asker, right? He sends out a great invitation. In fact, today we're going to look at a parable that he taught about the story of himself, of how that he wants to invite people to his banquet. So let's look. Luke chapter 14. If you want to read along with me, I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation, and I think it'll probably be on the Sky Bible over there if you want to watch and read along. Jesus replied with this parable. There was a man who invited many, say many, to invite him in a great feast, notice it's not a funeral. I think some people think church is a funeral, but being around the Lord should be a feast, right? Like you experience here. When the day for the feast arrived, the host instructed his servants to notify all the invited guests and tell them, come, for everything is now ready for you. But one by one, they all made excuses. One said, I can't come. I just bought some property. I'm obligated to go and look it over. Another said, please accept my regrets, for I purchased five team of oxen, and I need to make sure that they can plow. Another one said, I can't come because I just got married. The servant reported back to the host and told him of their excuses. So the master became very angry, and he said to his servants, go at once throughout the city and invite anyone. Would you read the, next of this, the rest of this sentence with me? Invite anyone you find. The poor, the blind, the disabled, the hurting, and the lonely. Invite them to my banquet. Wow. When the servant returned to his master, he said, Sir, I've done what you ask, and there's still room. So the master told him, All right, go out again, and this time bring them. Not just invite them, but bring them all back. Persuade the beggars on the street, the outcasts, even the homeless. Urgently assist that they insist that they come in and enjoy the feast so that my house will be full. I say to you all, the one who receives an invitation to feast with me and makes excuses will never enjoy my banquet. Yes. Let's pray. Lord, we sent your presence. Thank you for this lighthouse in this community. Thank you for the heritage that is in this house. Thank you, Lord, not stop and go leaders, but leaders that are consistent, committed to you. Thank you, Lord, for this house. Thank you for everyone that's here today. Lord, we, uh, we, we, want to, we just want to look in this parable and hear what you'd like to say to us. So I pray uh, humbly that you would anoint me because I know without you, it's just words. 
So help me to say what you want me to say and don't let me say anything I shouldn't say. And I pray today that you will be glorified, the saints will be edified, and the devil will be terrified in your name, Jesus. So when I look at this story about the kingdom, this is about the kingdom of God is really what he's saying. I want to, he said, I want to tell you a story, but the story is really about my kingdom. The kingdom of God is here and now that we experience, but there'll also be the fullness of it when we get to that new heaven and that new earth. So he's saying, I'm going to invite you to come to a banquet, to a feast that's here, like you're experiencing now in your relationship with the Lord. And then one day we'll sit down at that table with him in eternity. And what a banquet that'll be. You know, I, I don't know what it'll be like, but it'll probably be greater than any banquet you've ever seen. I don't know if it's literal, physical, uh, symbolic, uh, but uh, who cares? I'm just going to trust it. He said, okay, it's going to be a great one. All right. <clears throat> and I don't know the biggest banquet you've ever been to. I read the other day that there was a, the most expensive banquet <clears throat> that ever happened, happened in Dubai. It was a 10 day wedding. And the price of that wedding for all of that was $44 million. Wow. But that's, that's pale in comparison to the banquet that we shall be with the Lord and what we experience now. Amen. So he says, I want you to go out and, and let people know that I have a banquet ready for them and it's a feast. I want to, I, I want to honor them and give them things in their life. So first of all, when I look at this, I, it's two points today. Number one would accept the invitation. Say, accept the invitation. So how many of you know without a shadow of a doubt that you've accepted the invitation to the kingdom of God and invited Christ into your life? Would you raise your hand and say, hallelujah, that's me. I'm in, I'm in. So we want, we want to accept the invitation. So when I look at this, it says that, so he invited many, it was a great feast. And uh, then he said, come for everything is now ready for you. Come, come, everything is ready. You know, uh, sometimes we get an invite to go to somebody's house for dinner or to go somewhere. And, and my lovely wife, Anita, whom I just celebrated 31 years last week of living with her. Thank God. A joy in my life. And so she'll say to someone, if they invite us to their house for dinner, like probably you do, what can we bring? Because you always want to bring something, right? But Jesus, in telling this story, says... Everything's ready. You can't bring anything. There's nothing you can bring. There's nothing else Jesus has to do. He went to the cross and he said, it's finished. So when he invites us to come, he just says, bring whatever you're dealing with and lay it at the feet and let me take care of that. Let me forgive you of your sins. Let me give you a hope for eternity and let me give you a purpose for living. Just come, come as you are. It's what he's saying. You, you, you can't bring anything to that. And the second thing I see in this, that they begin to make excuses. Isn't it interesting how people make excuses? Let me read a few excuses to you. This is uh, real excuses from the Metropolitan Insurance Company. And this was published. These are real, these are real, real, real excuses that people gave for a wreck. And here they are. Reasons or excuses for automobile accidents. An invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my car, and vanished. A pedestrian had no idea which way to go, so I ran over him. I'd been driving for 40 years, fell asleep at the wheel, and had the accident. Here's another one. The other driver was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. Here's my favorite. I pulled over from the side of the road, glanced at my mother and all, and headed over the embankment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can see that one, right? Excuses. The world we're living in today is a master of excuses. Somebody said an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. And people are always giving an alibi. Why, you can't come to church. I can't come to church today. I, I can't do this today. I can't do that. And so what happens is eventually those alibis become a lullaby in their life. And they fall asleep and they fall away from the Lord. So he says, look at this. He said, they all began to make excuses. 
One said, I just bought some property and I'm obligated to go and look it over. In other words, he's saying, here's what he's saying. I can't come. I've got to take care of my stuff. Say stuff. We all have a lot of stuff, don't we? We have so much stuff, we have rental units to put our stuff in there that we'll never use anywhere, right? Stuff. We're living in a world today in which people are possessed by their possessions. Stuff, stuff. Got so many, so much stuff. You got to take care of your stuff. You know, I work six days a week. Today's Sunday. And you know, my stuff, I've just got to take care of my stuff. You would never buy property without looking at it. If you buy property without looking at it, I've got some oceanfront property in Gatlinburg that I'd like to sell you. The second one said, I just purchased a team of oxen, five teams, and I need to make sure they can plow. So the second excuse is my job just keeps me so busy. My job just keeps me so busy. I'm, I'm working at that. And, and yeah, I know I should. I should come to church. I should give my life to the Lord. I should be part of that. But I'm just so busy with my job. Throughout the years of preaching, I've been preaching, what, 50-something years now that you reminded me of that. And, uh, you know, people will come to a pastor and they'll say, I just, man, I just need a job. I need a job. Please pray I get a job. So the intercessors of church and begins praying, let's pray that, that Thomas gets a job. So Thomas gets a job. And then Thomas gets promoted. And Thomas gets promoted. And he gets promoted. And he becomes so successful. Hey, he's running two or three different places. And now Thomas, who once had nothing until he came to the banquet and sat down at the table with Jesus. And Jesus fed him success. And now he's so successful, he doesn't have time for Jesus. I think sometimes when people use that excuse, I'm just so, I'm so busy at my job, we should say, you know what, let me pray for you. Lord, I pray you'd take Thomas back to the place that he didn't have a job, but he had a heart for you, Lord. And the next guy says, and he's probably had a decent excuse, he said, I just got married. In other words, my family's taken up my time. My family's the most important thing. He, you know, he, he, he was saying, my wife won't let me come. That's not an excuse. In that culture, if the man was invited, the woman was invited. But isn't it interesting how that we can let family become an excuse that keeps us from the banquet table of the Lord? Oh, we've got, it's Sunday, but we got Little League. We got Rodeo. We got soccer. We got this. And the Titans are in town today, and it's a family day. And so we need to go out for that, right? See, a lot of parents live their life vicariously through their kids. You weren't a sports star, but you sure believe that your kid is. And you'll take them out of church on Sunday so that you can make sure that you get every game that there is. But the chance of your kid ever making it is point zero four percent but yet you're spending all of your life teaching them the most important thing is sports or what you do in life and then they become a young adult and you come crying to the pastor please pray for my kids please pray they're so far from god you know why you became so successful you became so occupied with that and you didn't have time with him and now you're missing the greatest thing you could ever do Christmas is coming soon. I love Christmas. You know what day Christmas is on? Sunday. Sunday. So already some of you are thinking, are we going to have church on Christmas this year on Sunday? Christmas is a day of, it's a family day. Heck no. Christmas is about the Messiah who came into this world and he gave his life so that we could come to a banquet and sit down and have eternal life. So they all had excuses. So the servant came back and reported to the master and said, uh, you know, everybody had an excuse. And the master was angry and he said, okay, go out through the city. And invite anyone. He said, I want you to go find the poor. 
I want you to go find that person that feels like they could never come to a banquet because they're poor. I, I could never bring anything. What could I bring? I, I'm poor. I have nothing. You, you don't understand. I could never, I could never bring a gift. I, I couldn't bring flowers. I couldn't bring anything. And Jesus says, go find that person that feels like they're too poor for anything else. And let them know they have a place at my kingdom table. And he said, then I want you to go find the blind. Isn't it interesting how that sinners act like sinners? I, I see sometimes Christians say, well, I just can't believe they act like that. They, they act, I just can't believe they wear those clothes and they act like that. What do you expect them to act like? They're sinners. They're blind. They're bouncing into things in life trying to find something that'll satisfy and they bounce off of this and they bounce off of that and they bounce off to someone else. But Jesus said, I want you to go find those that are blind and I want you to grab them by the hand and say, you know what? I you once was blind, but I found Jesus and Jesus changed my life. Go find the blind. Go find the poor. Go find the disabled. Those that can't make it to Jesus on their own. They need a little help. They need somebody to help carry them. They need some encouragement. Find the lonely. That one that woke up this morning and still living from the hangover last night. And just feel all alone. In fact, there's somebody in this service. That's exactly how you feel. You feel alone. It's strange to feel the love that you feel in this house. Because your temperament is that you've always felt alone. I guess that's why Jesus sent me today as an ambassador. To let you know, out of all the people in the world, that he wanted to hear this teaching today. And want you to hear that in your loneliness, he's coming to you. And he's tapping you on the shoulder and saying, come. Come and sit at my banquet table. Come and experience life. Come and experience family like you've never experienced. And he says, invite them to the banquet. So they do. And he comes back and he says, sir, we, 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 we still have room. So look at this. He says, first of all, accept the invitation. Second of all, invite everyone. And this time he says, go and bring them. Bring them. He said, go and bring them. Persuade the beggars on the streets, the outcasts, even the homeless. Urgently insist that they come in and joy and feast so that my house may be full. I don't know if God plays poker or not, but I believe he likes a full house. I believe he's saying to us today, every empty seat that you see here today, he's saying there's somebody that's lonely, there's somebody that's an outcast that nobody else wants to deal with. And he said, I'm sinning. Why, why do we... Why do we struggle in life by not inviting people to church? Why do we struggle in life of not talking to people about Jesus? I think one of the reasons is that we don't feel perfect. But here's what the Lord would say to you today. If you don't feel perfect, you're the perfect person that he selected to win the people in your sphere of influence. You see, you have a sphere of influence of people that, that, you, that you work with and, and some of you don't even want to work. You don't like to work with them. You think, man, I wish I had a different job but I don't even like to work here. Why am I working here? Could I tell you sometimes you're working there because of all the people that the Lord would trust? He's going to trust you to be an ambassador, to work with those people, to build a bridge so that you can invite them to him, invite them to church, bring them to church. See, the very thing that you feel like that makes you imperfect is the very perfect reason that Jesus puts you there. The very reason that you feel like you're disqualified by being somebody, well, I couldn't talk to anybody about Jesus. I couldn't invite somebody to church because I'm still struggling with struggles in my own life. I'm still struggling with addiction. I'm still struggling with this and still struggling with that. But you hear at church. You see, the very thing that you feel like that disqualifies you and discounts you is the very thing that God sees that qualifies you. So you look at somebody and they say, oh, I couldn't go to church. The, the, the roof would fall in, right? We hear that. The roof would fall in. And you say, but, but I go. Yeah, but I'm, I'm struggling with this. But I struggle with that same thing. You do. 
See what I'm saying today? We think it's up to the pastor. It's up to the worship team to, to go out and make sure the house is full. No, here's why the Lord sent me today. He's saying, look, look, look around you. Everybody here is an ambassador for me. Everybody here is a servant. And I put you with strategic people already, already, already in your mind. Two or three people have come to your mind and saying, yeah, maybe... Maybe that's what the Lord wants to do. Maybe, maybe he, he wants me to in, invite them. Maybe he wants me to bring them to church. He wants me to bribe them. Hey, come to church with me and I'll buy you lunch afterwards, right? The very thing that you think counts you out is the very thing that Jesus is counting on. Several years ago, you see, sometimes in, in, in theology, there's a term called redemption and lift. Redemption and lift means that we get saved, we get redeemed out of sin, and we're lifted to a different place. And what happens is that we hang around with Christians. We hang around with our family, that's good. But we don't really have any contacts with people that we should be inviting to the banquet. Several years ago, what, about seven or eight, Anita, I guess, the Lord spoke to me and he said, who are you trying to win well, every Sunday, Lord, I preach the message, give an altar invitation. No, you as an individual, who are you? So I said, okay, Lord, what do you want to do? And the Lord said, I want you to hire Al Cardiella, a trainer in town, expensive, and I want you to get him to train you and Anita. I said, Lord, that, that squatty little Italian, foul mouth, uh, whoremonger, uh, one woman to another, yeah, surely that's not the target. Yeah, that's him. Cost me money. So we work out and he's foul mouth and telling stories and carrying on and need a, I get, I just, I, do you ever think this is going to work? This is going to work? But I kept doing it because I felt like the Lord put me in his life yeah. to give him an invitation to change his eternity. That went on, I don't know, we, we paid out for several years. Right now, I guarantee you, Al's sitting in church at the Father's house in Leesburg. He's the first one that posts on social media everything that happened in the sermon. Just God just blessed him with two little twins. He does more and more to invite people, to invite people. And I look at that, and I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now he trains us for free. But anyway. <laughs> and so while I'm working out at the gym, this other young guy, a teenager comes up and, and he's training, working. And I say, hey, Norm, God loves you, man. You ought to come to church. Ah, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I said, okay, that's cool. No problem. You see, people say things just sort of throw you off. And I, I said to him, if I gave you a book to read, would you read it? He said, is it short? I said, yeah, it's short. So they gave him the book, and I just kept encouraging him, kept building a bridge, building a bridge, building a bridge, not condemning, not hard, not preaching at him, not saying you're on your way to hell, you're going to hell, but just being kind, being compassionate, being what Jesus would have. We don't need anybody else standing on the street corner and telling everybody you're going to burn, you're going to hell. We need people to reach out a hand and say, I love you, I care for you. Is there anything I can pray with you about? And let God open a door that will change their life. One day I'm on the elliptical machine. Norm comes up and says, hey, I'm ready to do the deal. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm ready to do the deal. I'm ready for Jesus. And I want to be baptized. Yes. Norm's a, co a CrossFit guy that travels across the world. He's one of the young up-and-coming guys in CrossFit. And I just said, God, Would there have been anybody else that might have reached Al and Norm? Maybe. But what if not? I challenged my staff. I said, you give me the names of three people that you're praying to lead the Lord that are sinners. Not somebody goes to another church, but somebody that goes nowhere. And we're going to pray until we see them come to the Lord. 
I give that challenge. And one of my guys that's one of my armor bears, he, he goes to a certain restaurant all the time and he meet people. He, he befriended the bartender there and the bartender started coming to church and the bartender invited another bartender. They came to church. Another one came to church, said, I've never been to church a day in my life. They invited Sarah who was going through cancer, lost all of her hair. Sarah came to church. She gave her heart to the Lord. And Sarah said, I took this serious, Terry. I took it serious. And I went and invited the worst person I could ever think about to come to church. And Sean said, I thought when she gave me his name, I thought, dang, I wouldn't invite him. He's never going to come to church. The guy looked at Sarah and he said, nobody has ever invited me to come to church my whole life. And I'll come with you, Sarah. I will. Who is that for you? Would you watch this video? Allow the Lord to speak to your heart. I'm Matt. You know me from work and we briefly talk every day by the coffee machine. As far as you know, my life is going fine, but reality is it's falling apart. I can barely make ends meet. I wish I knew what to do. I'm Julie. I run the gate for your community. You wave hi to me as you drive by after work. and I always wave back with a smile. I see the church sticker on the back of your car as you leave, and I just wish I could be a part of that. But I, my shyness has led me to a point of loneliness, and I just lose more hope every day. I'm Navik. I don't know much about you, but I do know that you're big into that church thing, and that you like your coffee order with light ice and no water. Most days I'm content, but sometimes I wonder what the purpose of life is. I wish I could ask if you knew the answer, but you seem so busy. I'm Brennan your personal trainer. I'm sure you think I have it all together because of my fitness level, but I've made a lifestyle of chasing a perfect image to feel valuable. I never feel satisfied. I see how you walk around with an inner joy that you say comes from your God, and I just wish I could have that. I'm too proud to ask to go with you to church, but I just wish you would ask me. Wow. Don't say no for people. The people that the Lord has brought to your mind a few minutes ago, don't say no. Don't say, they wouldn't come if I invited them. Say, but what if they asked me a difficult question? Just say, you know what? I don't know that answer. I know somebody who knows all answers, and that's Pastor Barry. I'll find out. <laughs> Put it on him. But just say this to people. Hey, would you come and see? Come and see. Three weeks ago, we had a big memorial for one of my best riding friends. We ride motorcycles. We've done the Kyle Petty charity ride cross country two or three times. He's uh, got a lot of contacts, with NASCAR guys. It was the week of the hurricane, so we had a lot of NASCAR guys flying in, but they couldn't make it because of the hurricane. But when we were there, one of the guys that was Jeff's friend said, you know what, Jeff, uh, Jeff invited me to watch your church service online. And he said, I do that every once in a while. But then he paused. And he said, but when I walked in the foyer, I felt something that I didn't feel online. When the worship started, I experienced something that I couldn't experience online. That's all I'm saying, folks. Just tell people, hey, come, come and see Come and see. It ain't your grandma's church. Come and see. It'll make a difference in your life. Now, before pastor comes and gives us all an invitation to come to the banquet, I want to pray for you that are, that are Christians. Those of you that during the teaching, somehow Holy Spirit began to bring maybe one, two, or three people to your mind. Say, yeah, Lord, I know that I need to build a bridge. See, I'm not a great, I, I'm not one of these great people that always walk into somebody and say immediately witness to them. I, I'm not one of those people. But I am one of those people when the Lord lays in my heart somebody who's far from him. I'll build a bridge. I'll love them. I'll care for them. Here's a, here's a prayer I pray every day. Lord, help me to be an influence in somebody's life today. And if you open the door, if you open the door, Help me to witness to them about your love. I want to pray for you. I feel like I need to impart something to you before I go back and preach at the other church. We got five more services? All right, so. But if the Lord is speaking to you, 
if this, if this teaching meant anything, would you just raise your hand very proudly, very honestly and say, yeah, that's me. There's somebody. Keep, keep it up. I want to pray for you. Father, I see these are ambassadors. We're not raising our hands for something that's easy, but we're raising our hand to see somebody's eternity changed. For that experience, that new heaven and that new earth. So Lord, I pray that you would, that I could impart, Holy Spirit, would you impart, would you impart the passion, the feeling that I have for this teaching today into the lives of those that have their hand raised? And the Lord, next time I come back to this church, would you have some of those that raise their hand and say, you know what? I raised my hand on that Sunday morning and guess what? The Lord allowed me to bring somebody to the Lord and they brought somebody else and they brought somebody else. Can you imagine eternity when you get there at that marriage supper of the Lamb and somebody comes up to you and say, thank you so much that you invited me to the kingdom. You invited me. I knew you could spend all eternity together in celebrating Him.